Well, good afternoon, all. Uh, welcome to uh, Advisor Crafts International School of Life Insurance Sales. This is Solus number seven for September 2022. I'm your host, Jim Ruta, and thank you for being with us again. You know, my continuing crusade in this business is to preserve promote and propel the life insurance advisor business with top insurance sales ideas to help you help more and sell more. I think those things are absolutely tied together. And of course, we want to preserve the life insurance advisor business, promote the life insurance advisor as being that person that can help and propel the results that those folks, people just like you get every day. So my Solus, of course, is sponsored in part by our uh, life preservers, our folks over here, uh, Custom Plan Financial Advisors in Vancouver, Bruce Edrington and Associates in Toronto, Forster's Financial Group, Enforced Life Financial, and insurance-portal.ca. So we thank them, of course, all the time. Now, for the first six sessions, Solus has featured world-class producers and some trainers with great sales strategies, and I can't thank them enough for their contribution. I'm not sure about you, but I've got a lot of response from many about how tremendous this has been uh, and the great stories. I mean, they're still talking about Bruce, and that was back six months ago. Today, I want to make sure that we are all singing from the same sh song sheet uh, as it goes, as far as a sales process is concerned. You know, having worked with literally thousands of advisors over the years, I know that not everyone has the same handle on a sales process or a same grip on what they're doing. And, you know, unfortunately, we just haven't done enough of this training over the past 25 years. And it really shows in lots of ways, frankly. So today, I have several sales topics I will cover and will draw from the materials that you were sent this morning. And if you didn't get them for some, some reason, of course, we will send them to you as well. Now, there is a ton of material here. I acknowledge that. Um, and I will be going over it, not in horrific detail, but in good detail so you understand what's getting on. I am always available for your questions. If you have questions about that, if you want to see how it would work with your stuff, I'm always there for you as well. So, and we'll see just how far through them we all get today. So there are three parts to this, that basic sales process, including a copy of the system that's described on the Solus webpage so that you've got that. And I wanted that basic information there. There's a more detailed sales track based on our essential financial security concept that has been extraordinarily successful, successful uh, across North America, uh, is making a big difference for a lot of advisors. And finally, I'm going to give you an overview of the 14 life insurance pr uh, advisor practice this management traps uh, that are holding uh, so many advisors back. And so you're going to get all of this in two hours. The good thing is, uh, aside from the odd interruption from uh, Andre uh, on questions, uh, I will get a chance to go right through this. Again, you do have the recording and you will get the AI transcript, which will include everything I say. So I know there's a ton of information here. And my friend Van Miller, who I spent a few days with last well, a week and a half ago, I guess, in uh, Las Vegas would be annoyed at the detail, uh, but I want to help set the stage for a great fall 2022 and an even better start to 2023. Remember, that's what's going on here. If you can get a great start to the fall, get the fall going, that just leads into a great 2023. And I can't tell you, you know, this time between right now and the end of the year, uh, a lot of we routinely would do at least 50% of our business, sometimes as much as 60% of our business in the agencies I worked with in the past, at this time between now and the end of the year, it just is the best time of the year to work. So before we get started, may I refer you to my Facebook live video titled, Have You Found Your Crusade? Now, there's a, by getting a lot of response there, it's been kind of interesting to me, and it really is predicated on a comment, an offhanded comment by Van Miller on stage that he and I were doing in Las Vegas. And it was just a, you know, he was talking about this crusade that he was on. And it occurred to me that that is really what we have to be on. The short story is that rather than a mission, you need to be on a crusade. And a crusade is a vigorous campaign of social change, just one prospect at a time. 
And as Van would say, you don't sell products, you inspire people to make decisions that change their financial security world, what I call their essential financial security. Find that purpose, light up that passion, and you will be more confident, resilient, creative, and successful. So to help you on your crusade, let's start with the basic uh, process report. Now, just a side note, if you have any questions along the way, please put them in the Q&A. Now, if you don't want to do it that way, you can email me directly. I will respond to them personally after we speak, after, after today's presentation. So you can get to me uh, after jr at jimruta.com, jr at jimruta.com, and uh, I will respond to them directly. But if you have them, uh, you want to ask them, put them in the Q&A. And uh, Andre, I've, I've instructed Andre to uh, interrupt me whenever he feels that something important has to be done. So if you don't choose, that's okay. But if you do, that'd be great too. So let's get uh, let's get right to it. And I want to talk to you about this basic sales process. Now, the truth is, there's a core to every sales process, regardless of who you are. If you're successful at this, there's a core, there's a skeleton, there's an outline, there's a system, a process that works. And regardless of what we are selling and who we are selling it to, professionals are always adding and subtracting from a basic process that underpins every sale that they make. Now, all the sales that I, ideas that we featured here on Solus and the industry icons that have presented them presume that we all have a similar understanding of the sales process. The outstanding ideas that we've heard and everything that we hear from time to time in these sessions need to fit into this basic process or a model, uh, or else they are just only random good ideas with no real home. Uh, and when that happens, regardless of how good the ideas are, they will not have the value that they could have for you. So as I've been moderating and working my way through Solace and watching and listening to what's going on, I realize that we all need to have a common reference point so that we can use these great ideas more effectively. We don't want to throw out our existing ideas and start fresh every time. There's a strategy, by the way, that some people think, well, I, I just heard uh, Sandro Forte, uh, uh, Bruce Etherington did this, uh, you know, uh, George Sigurdsson talked like that, and they want to I'm going to throw it all away, I'm going to start over. Uh, that's really, I think, a problem because that's a good way for many advisors to get into real trouble. And it'd be a shame because everyone on this call is doing something right. So we want to keep doing what we're doing right and then add a little as we can along the way. And that's really the whole intention behind Solace. The whole intention behind Solace is to remind you, to give you ideas, to perk you up, to, to say, hey, gosh, He's doing it. I can do it. Is that all it takes? I could do that. And that's what we want. So, and, 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 and truly, the surest way to go into a slump or even fail out of the business, and it's happened altogether, for most advisors is to discard everything that they're doing and then start fresh whenever they hear a good approach, as I was talking about a minute ago. In, in the time it takes to reestablish yourself, you could lose it all. So, and alternatively, you just can't keep adding new ideas on top of old good ideas and then expect to be more successful. That dog don't hunt either. You can't just keep pounding things on. Here's a good idea. That's a great idea. You know, we'll take uh, here's the here's the, 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 the this great piece from uh, George George <laughs> from John Savage. You know, there's two kinds of people in the world: spend first, save later, save first, spend later. You know, this idea. You know, and the cool thing is that these people, the spenders, always work for the savers. That kind of thing. Say, well, that's a great idea. Now, if it fits, great. If it doesn't. Just one of those things you keep in the back that someday may show up. So you have to be careful because otherwise you'll be overcomplicating, overcomplicating rather the process, and that makes it harder to follow both for you and for your prospects. Instead, this is this is why we need a tweaking and a tuning process that adds what's appropriate and subtracts what is not. So. What are the key parts of, of every sales process? And I'm going to be going through a couple of these too. So you're going to see this today. And you've got all of this in writing. But I wanted you to understand this. And I, I call this a bucket brigade approach where each step is connected to the next. Bucket brigade. And it really works that way. It's like this hands off to this, that hands off to this. Maybe maybe it's a relay race. Maybe that's a better analysis. analysis but that's the idea. 
And let me go, let's, let's just get right at it then. So number one is you need inspiration to get started. And so the idea is what part of the business moves you so much that you're prepared to make the calls and take the responses so that you can help people who get it. Remember, not everybody understands this. Not everybody gets the story. I'm just thinking about a book that I wonder if I have in front of me, which I do, in fact. By the way, if you want, if you're interested, this is a book like this, this one here, Power Versus Force, Power Versus Force by David R. Hawkins, MD, PhD. An amazing book. This is The Hidden Determinants of Human Behavior. It's a crazy book, I, 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 crazy good I, to me. Not everybody can read it, frankly. But I say this because it, it, will, it explains to you why not everybody gets it. Why, you know, you think, well, gee, was it something I, no. Sometimes you can't win for losing. Sometimes the people don't get it. This book, and by the way, if, you, if you're in Canada and you're interested, this book you can get, I think, pretty easily for like 10 bucks um, at book-outlet.ca. Book, I think it's book-outlet. I'm pretty sure it's that. It's not just book-outlet, but book-outlet.ca. Cra crazy good book. Gives you some real good background. So you need inspiration. Now, and this is what I, this is the I in Icon Protocol, which of course, right, where is it here? It's right behind me here. In the, in the ICON protocol, ICON protocol, inspiration is that first thing. You need to be inspired. That's where the crusade idea comes in from that, that Van Miller was talking about the, the other day for me. A crusade. Not just, not, not well, you know, I'm in business, but, but a crusade. And I tell you, if there's, and it's funny, this is one of these words that it, it struck me like a ton of bricks on the main stage at, in this, you know, in this hotel, <laughs> casino in Las Vegas. I thought, oh my God, that's the difference. Vans on a crusade. A lot of people just have a mission, you know, a 35 to 75 word run on sentence of currently fashionable buzzwords that affects nobody's, nobody's behavior or, or their performance. So you need to be inspired. He's inspired to do this. And it's the basis of all great advisors' business. So remember, in ICON protocol, inspiration, communication, organization, and numeration, all four parts of that are part of this. And perhaps we'll get a chance to talk about that more. And if you're interested, let me know. I have material on that. Number two, so we need inspiration. Number two, we need lists of names to call. And, you know, it's funny, I was coaching some clients last week, and one of the thought topics that came to mind as we're getting to the end of the year, and, you know, they're kind of maybe a bit, you know, and, and, and legitimately, it's been a quieter summer and been very hot here in Southern Ontario. So, eh, you know, eh, you know, don't want it. So, well, what about a list of the top 20 people you haven't called yet, but you should have? Everyone has a list like this. Uh, I talk about this as a project forever. Some of you may recall the Project 100 idea, Project 100 from Limra many years ago, where you kind of listed the names of the people you knew from your work and your, your, your wife's work and for your previous work and for your, from your kids' sports, from your sports, from your hobbies, from your religious activities, from your community service, from your community, whatever associations or groups you're part of, whatever. And you made, you made those lists. Part of the value of that, of course, back in the day, was to say, hey, you know a bunch of people. It's not like you don't know anyone. Because when you start, we have this terrible feeling sometimes. I, I just don't know anybody. <laughs> I, I did when I came in here, but all of a sudden, I'm lost. I don't know anyone. No, not true. You do have that. But you can keep doing that. And rather than just making a list of 100, I call it a project forever, because you keep making the list. A friend of mine, many, a client of mine, many years ago, if more than 40 years ago, told me that in his marketing, he was a marketing executive. He says, you know, the idea is to keep a list, he said, in a notebook. So you could keep it wherever you want. It could be on your cell phone today. We didn't have cell phones in 1978. Um, but, you know, you could keep a list of everybody you wanted to talk to, but, but you haven't. You know, and if you're wondering, <laughs> this reaches over, where you might find some great scripts for this, Modern Appointment Selling by our pal, Gail Goodman from last month. Well, I've got it all highlighted here too, but with flags everywhere. This is, it's got the information. You know, the whole story here. So I, I, I know you're calling up to someone and say, well, I have to apologize. I've been meaning to contact you for a long time and I haven't, but I should have. And people say, well, you don't have to apologize. And there's a great story and it's in there. 
best 20 bucks US you can spend uh, on, available at Amazon. So that's that whole strategy here. And this is not to say, by the way, that you would automatically attack these people, um, but you can follow a, a process of making them part of your constituency, the, the group of people, your prospect list, the funnel, as you may want to look at it that way. So that you have to have lists, but we all have lists. Well, I don't have nobody, Jim. No, you do. If you've been in this business for any, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Rick in, in Windsor, Ontario. Rick, we've got lots of people we haven't talked to. We have lots of clients we haven't talked to. Van Miller in Vegas not long ago, well, you know, he said, you know, we're still doing the same thing we did at the beginning of the pandemic. And, and maybe you remember this. Some of you have been following me. You would see this. But there was just three questions they continue to ask that make a huge difference, that get people to talk to him. And he might phone up and he might say, Rick, it's Jim, Jim Ruta calling your insurance agent. Just calling up to just as a check-in call, are you okay? Go through that. Do you need anything? Go through that. Do you have any questions? No. Well, I have some things. I have a few ideas that the best way I can repay you for your loyalty to me over the years is to help you understand a few things. Do you have a couple of minutes more? And to go on. And that's all it takes. And by the way, I say, well, I don't have any more time. That's great. You've done something very positive. And here's the cool thing. There's no clever transition required from just saying hi to really having people finally ask you to buy something. Everybody? No, of course not everybody, but as enough people to make it worthwhile. And of course, that same process, if you were here, Sandro Forte talked about his check-in call. Before that, you know, in, in advisor, you know, in, at last year's sales congress, Ontario Canada Sales Congress, rather, you know, we had the same story coming from Tony Gordon and the people that worked with him in Southern England. This is the best idea nobody uses. So you want to, you need the list. We have the list whether there are clients and people we haven't called, our personal observation, all these connections, take a look at it, you can go. Now, the third thing we all have to have is, of course, is an appointment under favorable circumstances. And nothing happens without an appointment, and nothing is more important to your business because no appointments means no business, means no money, means, well, you know, nothing. You're done. You're cooked. So how do you do it? Well, and, and you know, you must say and do something that is so compelling that the prospect wants to hear what you have to say more than they are afraid of being sold something. And you just think about that. Uh, you know, and I got to tell you, I borrowed that from Van, but it's a crazy cool idea in the sense that they, what you say is so compelling, they want to hear it more than they're worried about being sold something. And let's face it, we're all worried about being sold something. Oh, geez, am I going to buy that? Is this going to happen? But wait a minute, this is that important that I darn well better hear it. And so that's what we're getting at. And that's why you need those appointments. So yeah, well, what you want to say? So this is a high bar, but we don't work at this enough. We simply must get their attention. Back when I was a young agent, we had this AIDS process. Of course, AIDS was something else different later, was something different later, but it would be a, a, attention, interest, uh, and desire. Uh, it was, I guess, just aid system, which would be fine, but S was something else. But attention, interest, and desire to speak with you. And we continue to have to do that. You see, whether or not we are having terrible, uh, you know, whether the world keeps changing and, and as technology continues to develop, still regular folks, regular people that you can work with, and they still get the same, the same sorts of ideas still work. So you have to get their attention. And this requires understanding your product uses and the product values so well that you know how to manipulate them effectively to advantage the prospect. So you can tell a compelling story. This can also mean that knowing you have to know the technical background of the product so well that we can provide the right context. Uh, to its ownership. This is where a guy like Mark Halpern, who a, a partner of mine on uh, Power of Platinum program, which you do somewhere else, um, but is it, so good at this. He understands the background enough on philanthropy and philanthropic product that he can set the stage properly. And remember, I think I've said this before here, 
but it's you know it, you know it's like it's how you set up your questions that makes the questions that much more successful, more powerful. So we need to provide context as well. And remember something, and that's a line I think that's very useful to remember in this business. We are in a high content and high context business. High content means there's lots to know. And high context means there's a lot of different ways to make it fit. And you have to know the background in the situation in order to make things work properly. So you have to have a focused idea, a lead story, if you will, which is what we call it here, that gets their attention and opens them up to knowing more. So after we get the appointment, we have to have a meeting approach. Like, what are we going to do when we get there? Clearly, that's vital stuff. And it it's not as obvious as all that. Now, when I was a young advisor going back to the late 70s, we were told, well, you know, you had a 10 minute kind of, you know, just, a, you know, just sort of a conversation. You just had a chat about things, a warm up period, so to speak. And then you would work, you would get into the, into, into general problems. And then you would divide them into, get them into a bit more specific problems. So you would have a discussion that kind of started to focus people on the conditions or the situation at hand. So, but in a meeting, we have to introduce uh, a topic that we discussed in that engaging that we've discussed before in an engaging manner so that we build the curiosity that we created to get the appointment. There needs to be, you know, what they call, you know, the rest of the story. You must build their interest in hearing and learning more with good background information and great questions to discover their interest and in the benefit discussed. Now, this reinforces their curiosity and builds their interest in the idea proposed. We start with general consumer knowledge and then move to more and more client-specific knowledge. You see, there is a process here. Now, the idea is to, uh, is to get them so interested that they will ask you for help. And, you know, probably the greatest discovery in, in the last couple of years for me has been that whole idea, is that if we can say enough, ask enough interesting questions with the right kind of background, that in fact, you know, that... We, people will say, geez, Jim, I don't know what to do. Can you help me with that? I don't know what I would do. What would you do in that circumstance? And the magical point of that is really simply this, that when somebody asks you for help, asks you for advice, they have automatically made you their advisor. And now, you can begin to guide them, to show them. I remember years ago, I sold a, a senior account who ended up being you know, a national partner uh, of a major accounting firm, a worldwide accounting firm. And um, I remember he introduced me once at a Toastmasters meeting that I spoke, that I, I, he and I were both members of. And he said, you know, uh, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Jim Ruta, who recently, a life insurance agent who recently walked me down the rough and rocky path to buying life insurance and showed me what to do. And I never thought that. He helped me pick my way and, and, and his wife, Sylvia, pick our way down that rough and rocky path to buying a life insurance pro, a program for ourselves and for our family. I never forgot that. Rock picking my way. That's really what we're doing, isn't it? Now, you can, so when they ask, you're their advisor. So remember, but, but, and, but as we're doing this, remember the best first question ever in an interview is still this. You know, Mr. Prospect, Ms. Prospect, you know, Prospect, it's always, never know how to write this now. But Prospect, obviously, you had a reason for agreeing to meet with me today. Would you mind telling me what it is? And then answering, just answering that question so that you know, they know that you're interested in helping them first. Mr. Prospect, obviously you had a reason for agreeing to, to meet with me today. Would you mind telling me what that is? And then deal with that first. The best first question ever. It's client-centered. It's we care about you before we care about me kind of talk. Number one thing, if you learn nothing else in two hours today, that would be worth it. Now, number five step here is something that we, we end up having to do. I don't think it's terribly helpful necessarily, um, but it's required. And so in that case, it is helpful. 
we engage the client in writing to fulfill our compliance responsibilities once they show us that they want help. I think once they have said, and this is the point, yeah, can you help me? So yeah, now we have to engage them in writing. It's, you know, it's the technically the first step in the six step uh, CFP, uh, you know, pr process. It's step one, engage the client in writing. So we need to do that. So you need to have that engagement piece. If you don't have one, ask me, I can generate that. I have, I have all kinds of them. Now there's, there is, there are requirements. There are, uh, there are things in regulation. There are things, all I'm getting at is that it's a, it's an important consideration and it, that's, this is where it fits in. So like I said, written compliance or written engagement can vary by jurisdiction and by re professional responsibility. You know, CFPs may require different things than CLUs or uh, otherwise. Uh, but if you need help, we, can, we do have some of those resources here at Advisory Craft. The next step is, of course, custom tailoring a solution to match their situation related to the need that interests them. That's the next thing we're doing. Now, this requires getting sufficient personal or corporate essential financial security information about or from the prospect. And you do have to get that information somewhere. You have to do this. I was just looking at something from Tennessee uh, a, a little, half an hour before we started. Um, and, and, you know, this has had a bunch of uh, just, it was a boxes approach. I think very much under the leap system where, where information was put into a box, not on a questionnaire, but in, in box questionnaire kind of format. All good. You do, but you do need, and I think this is the basic understanding of all this, you do need to have the uh, requisite information to be able to, you have to have, I guess, sufficient information to make the recommendations you're going to make to sell the products you're going to sell when you're doing this job. Today, this is just part of the deal. So you use a fact finder, to justify those recommendations. Those can be handwritten, they can be digitalized, lots of formats for this, but you do need to have them. Uh, so you've got it. Then you get number seven part of this is the situational analysis or the situation analysis. And it really has two levels. The first is your basic general analysis that you've already done. That is the reason for your approach in the first, in the first place. So we have to have this basic understanding. In my case, I might say, well, essential financial security. You realize how important that stuff really is. You know, we start drawing pictures. You know, I start drawing stuff like this diagram here where, you know, we say here are the essentials. These are, and then we have a plan and then we do the extras. We have an approach in this format. You know, I, I've also drawn it very simply. Actually, it's more, well, it looks really code-like. Uh, essentials, <laughs> essentials plan, and then extras. It's just a cool diagram, but you need to have that sort of situational analysis. That's the first thing. That's what we're based, basing all of this on. The second level of this is, is for the, the individual's client situation analysis. How does the solution we're talking about or the situation uh, get solved in this prospect's individual personal circumstance? And there's a lot of different analysis programs and they all have their benefits. And whether you're, you, and I don't even have to mention them, you, there's up to here and there's new ones and there's old ones and there's, uh, it, there's lots of different systems. But I think the key here in all of this is to use them as a tool and not as an end in and of themselves. And I think that's where the danger is. That's where why we, you know, when I just sort of scrawl this on a piece of paper, I say the plan comes after the essentials. The essentials are those things you can do without a plan. Save money. Don't need a plan. Put a hundred bucks away, a thousand bucks a month away, whatever the deal is. You don't need a plan for that. Just put it away. Just say, I don't care putting it in a, in a, you know, in my, when I grew up in the farm many years ago, they put it into a mason jar and I'd hide it, you know, in, in the barn, uh, you know, underneath the, where the cows were. I'm, I'm not even making that up. It's the way that was. Um, so there are basics. And then the plan comes next. The plan is a tool that integrates both the essentials and those um, extras that make for uh, all that exciting stuff that we do in our planning process. So remember this, that when, when plans are, and, and, and analysis plans are tools for a purpose, people understand, and, and when they're used as tools, people understand um, why they're being used, and they're more likely to provide full, honest, and complete answers. And of course, that's what you're looking for. Remember, you know, it's that old gigo strategy, garbage in, garbage out. 
if you, you know, if you don't get all you need, you're going to get, you're going to have a partial answer. And it's just never the same. It's kind of reminds me of the story about, you know, uh, a camel is a horse created by a committee, not directly related, but you get the point. If you don't get enough, you can get an awful, some strange answer sometimes. But complicated fishing expeditions without detailed and reasonable purpose don't engage prospects properly to create the business environment conducive to financial self-improvement. And really, that's what we're doing, isn't it? We're trying to help people out, help them solve some problems. We're not just promoting a product to drive our revenue because, man, if they get that sense as they're talking, as you're talking, as they're listening, you're cooked. You're done. It doesn't work that way. The next step, number eight on this, is to present the recommended solution. Now, this has to be presented in a manner that demonstrates that we know who they are and uh, what they said they wanted. So we, we can't be, as I like to say, tone deaf. Well, it doesn't matter what you say, everybody gets this answer. We have to be able to present this in a fashion that our solution answers their problem. It relates to them, what they're doing. This has to be critical. And they, will, and, and they also have to know, by the way, and, and, and appreciate why um, they want to invest in it. Everything we do costs money. By the way, including doing nothing costs money. Let's remember that, of course. I mean, every look, the plan you write is less expensive than the plan you don't write. Like the plan you don't, the will you don't write is much more costly than the plan, than the will, geez, than the will you do write. You know, I, I, I did, we, we had a will done a couple of years ago. It was $3,500 for my wife and myself, 3,500 corporate. Uh, so we had here in Ontario, secondary wills for the corporate assets for both of us, because we both have companies um, and 3,500 bucks. And you know what? That's, but not having that would be much more expensive. It's like, you know, it's, it's like you think life insurance is expensive. Try dying without it. Things of that nature. And that's where understanding all this comes in. And that's really, so we must show how our solution is the ideal way for, uh, for them, for their particular circumstances. Now, the next thing is kind of quick. We made a presentation. We've, we've come a long way here. Uh, you know, the, the next trick really is, or the next problem comes into you thinking to yourself, well, how do I close them? You know, and I remember closing being a scary time when I was a young agent. Remember, I started, I was 21 years old, and the whole idea thought, really, closing? And then you realize that as life goes on, that closing happens automatically when you realize that they see the value of your recommendation. And this is where we have to have the courage and the understanding of our own business and our product, the belief in our product. You see, when you can sense the agreement or that they can just or they can they maybe just say as much, then we know that they have bought. You'll see, you'll feel that, you'll understand that. They say, well, that makes sense to me. They, did, they didn't say, please sell that to me, Jim. Well, that sounds good. I, I like that. Boom, now we know. Now we just keep on going. Closing does not require a fancy line to make the deal. You know, uh, I, it, it doesn't require that. I mean, we may think that, but it doesn't. When we feel they are ready to proceed, we are doing them a favor by helping them buy. You know, that makes sense to me. Well, that's great, uh, Jim. Uh, terrific. Let, let me just see. I'll just need a little bit more information here to get this right. And we, guess, and we get right into the application, right into the way the process starts for you, whether you're using you know, computers or you're using paper, and people here are doing both. So it depends on what works best for you, what you want uh, to see best for your client. Then I think reassurance may be required. Now, that's kind of the next step here, obviously, because not everybody, well, 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 wait a minute, Jim, what are you thinking? Uh, well, I didn't say I was going to buy something. And that happens. By the way, it happens more often than it doesn't happen. There's the other thing, you know, like a talking to top advisors. And you, know, and you say, like, I remember talking to a guy named Brian Scott. And Brian says, you know, a lot of people think that because I'm top the table, I do very well. He said that nobody says no to me. He says, that's just so far from being the truth. He says, I, everybody says no to me. I get so many no's, it's ridiculous. 
And I think that's something that we don't even appreciate sometimes in this business about how often, look, the idea is to get past the no and to appreciate it, to understand it, and to help people buy. This is where you want to become assistant buyers uh, rather than the sellers of a product, right? And so if they balk at proceeding with the recommendations, and like I said, this happens way more often than you think, or then, then it doesn't, that's when you need to re review the process and then confirm their agreement with the steps that you've taken so far. So let me see. Okay, so I know. Oh, so there's a, okay, it seems to be, sounds like you have a question here. Is that, is that pretty much it, Jim? And see if that's the deal. And then see what they come up with. You want to convert questions or uh, rather, uh, uh, you know, I hate the word, but objections into questions. This sounds like this may be a problem. Of how will this fit into your budget? Is that pretty much what you're saying? And this gives us an opportunity to answer the question and not deal with the emotional heat of the objection in this case. I call it balking or hesitation, of course. So a lot of times, it's something that my old partner many years ago, wise old fellow, um, since passed, sadly. Um, but he would, well, he would have been in his late 90s. <laughs> so I guess that's about, he did pretty well. But he would say we would, be, we would want to review the bidding, as it were, review the bidding to see where they were and just kind of go through that. Just help. Remember, you're helping them buy. You're not pushing them to buy. You're helping them along. You're reaching down and bringing them up to your level. Remember, if they don't understand, it's your fault. Now, could some people just not get it? They're not going to get it. You know, and I, rem I, I remember, and I've said this many times when I've spoken uh, I, you know, I, out, out there in, in, many times. You know, I, I had a guy that I, my third sale was going to be, a, this is like 1977, 1978, probably. It was $110 a month premium, which was like real money, considering, you know, I was making, uh, you know, $18,000 a year at the time. Um, and uh, this this guy, and, and I remember saying, I remember saying to him, oh, I'm Mike, shall we go ahead? And the guy said to me, if you think I'm going to spend that kind of money, so that my wife can move in with my neighbor down the street when I'm gone, buddy, you've got another thing coming. It ain't going to happen. And I was like floored. It was my third interview. We had, he had gone along all the way. It was all just tickety-boo. It was working so well. And I was, I was floored. And the only person in the room whose face looked probably more floored than mine was, yeah, you guessed it. His spouse, his wife was there. She's a mother of three little girls. He, she was crushed. I was crushed. But man, it, remember, no commission I could ever make is in any small percentage even in, in, in proportion to the value that that family would have had in that circumstance. But we do what we can. You don't win them all. Uh, the best salespeople in the world don't sell more than about uh, two out of three two, one out of two, that, that's about as far as it gets. Nobody has a hundred percent sales closing ratio. Nobody. Oh, oh, not true. Somebody will tell you, well, I, I close a hundred percent of the sales that I make. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it, I, there's ways of making sure that, that that's a number, but if, by the way, if you're only closing the ones that you're guaranteed to get, you don't get the ones that you could have gotten if you had asked. It's a big deal. I knew a guy who was a kind of a mid-level production club kind of guy, a low, lower mid-level production club guy years ago. And he has, I, I, I said, he said, he says, I have a hundred percent closing ratio. And I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. And he, what, what? I said, no, I'm sorry to hear that. Because you're closing only the easy ones. You're missing so many. No, no, no. I trained him. I showed him how asking the one, asking for sales where he didn't think there was one, and then dealing with the balking and the hesitation and providing the reassurance. That guy's production tripled. It just tripled. And I'll never forget it. And Dave was never the same after that. He said the whole business changed for him. Number 11, after you get a sale, you make the sale, oh, oh great, you want to make delivery a special event. Now, I know people don't, like, I think delivery is not even a thing anymore, but there's so many options, there's so many opportunities here with deliveries that make things that much better. And I just think it's important 
that we get, that we continue to do that. And this single approach can build your brand more than anything else you do. It works in all serious sales businesses too, and it need not take a lot of money. Like who forgets getting even a custom keychain with a new car they buy? And that scarcely happens today. Uh, well, you know, it depends on the value of the vehicle sometimes, but it could work. What a custom keychain was it? 10 bucks, 20 bucks. You, you, imagine what that can do. Who forgets? Or how about an even a high quality doormat when they move into a new home after a purchase or a renovation? And I can tell you I've had it not happen to me. And you go, what, you couldn't have done this? And how about making a donation in the name of a client to their favorite charity? Wouldn't that be a cool thing? And you don't even have to, nobody even knows how much. You make a donation to the Heart and Stroke Foundation on behalf of your client, you know, uh, whose parents maybe you died from a heart, a heart attack or a stroke or a parent or a, or, or a family member or something. And they, they just say a donation was made in your name, Jim Ruta, by, you know, Rick Fox in Windsor because of the deal that we did. Oh, my God. It's an amazing thing. All of that happens. And you can do those things when you deliver these things. Or how about a high quality binder, pad folio, file box, or even a safe when a contract is delivered, regardless of the size of the sale. You know, I'm reminded that George Sigerson used to tell me, he said, you know, everybody, I, I, I could lose money on a deal and they all get a copy of my leather pad folio. Because if I've taken them on as a client, then they deserve all of that. By the way, he says, when they're a client of mine, by the way, he said, and you know this, it's much easier to sell clients than it is to sell prospects. He says, but once I've got them, now I can work with them and everything changes. So do that. It, it dramatically minimizes buyer's remorse and, ma and maximizes product and solution value and business persistency. That's why it's done. Some, some people say, well, yeah, you know, we don't do, we don't, we, it's all virtual, Jim. The company sends it. Uh, and I work with people like this. It's fine. We'll send a delivery kit to the client once they've got their stuff and they can put it in here. And if it's all virtual via Zoom, then we can work our way through it and it's fine. But all of this stuff, what does this do? This makes you look like a hero. And here's the thing, people recommend heroes. They recommend heroes. You know that, be that hero. And so, we deliver that. You, you want to make it a special occasion that makes it really different. And remember something. And number 12 here is make the annual review appointment immediately after delivery. I mean, during the delivery. And, and there, if there was one rule I learned and, and, and was slapped around, you know, figuratively, uh, because if I forgot, it was this. And I think a lot of advisors forget. You never leave one appointment without setting up the next one ever. Because you say, well, I'll tell you, I'll check my book and I'll get back to you. Are you kidding me? Because that does not work. That's a horrible mistake. And you never want to do that. You always make that appointment when you're doing that. And you, and, and by the way, the, the next appointment will, will, will be in, in your calendar. It'll be all ready to go. You're filling up. Look, this year's sales are leading to next year's sales. Just because they bought this year doesn't mean they can't buy next year. In fact, there's always something. You didn't sell everything you could have this time anyway. There are so many opportunities. Number 13 is another strategy that you know I heard recently that is just, um, it's been a while, I guess, but what a great thing. The follow-up 30 days after delivery to check in. Follow-up 30 days after delivery to check in. What? Who does this? I never, I never did this. And you're almost afraid to do it. Well, I, I don't want to. I don't want them to get excited and cancel the policy. No. Ask how they are feeling about the product. Do they have any questions? Do they have any concerns? Is there anything else they might want to do? That thirty days thing is kind of a cool time. It gives them a chance to sort of okay, I kind of get settled with this. I understand the money situation. I know what's going on. And if it's going to be something that you don't want to know, you better know it then rather than have it just mysteriously happen to you. This is something that I think I believe very few advisors do, but when you do, you mark yourself as a true professional, truly concerned about them. 
and I think it su substantially solidifies um, the sale for you as well. There's one other point to this. This is the ideal time. If they say, no, it sounds great, uh, Jim, you did a great job. Thank you very much. We're, we feel better about this. We got more peace of mind, just like you said we would. I said, oh, great. You know, any is there anyone that you know who has expressed any similar interest like this? Or did you think that, is there anybody you know who should have that same peace of mind that you've had here because of this? Maybe someone came to mind. You know, what a great opportunity to ask for an introduction. I'd love you to introduce me to them. I don't know whether I can help them or not like you, but if I could, that would be great. And you know, I'll treat them like gold because I believe, you know, I, your our relationship is very important to me. That's simple stuff like that. And that 30-day um, check-in to get strong introductions, that, again, I think that is absolutely uh, important. You know, again, and it's here It's here in your report, too. You know, as we were going through your, situ your situation, who came to mind as someone who might also benefit from this process? And then talk, but stay silent until they speak. Remember, you only need one good prospect to start an endless chain of prospects. Remember, that's kind of the cool thing about this. And we don't talk about endless chain prospecting. We don't talk much about a personal observation prospecting. We don't talk about prospecting in nests, uh, you know, social groups, racial groups, cultural groups, um, uh, you know, uh, occupational groups. But all of those strategies that were like, oh, that's too far. It's too, oh, Jim, that's so last century. Uh, no, that all works. Endless chain. That means I sell you. And then you refer me to somebody else that I sell them. And maybe it's like I get two, if I get two names or three names from everybody I talk to, I can keep that endless ch chain going forever. Advisors in the day, back in the day, we used to keep track of this stuff. We used to have fun with this. Hey, that's the, this is like the 35th guy on my list. And I say this because this is sales talk. And, oh, we don't do sales. But that's what soulless is all about. It's about helping you understand the business that you're in. And, you know, you're not in the planning business. It was, it was Al Grana many years ago who said that, you know, if you think you're a planner or you're an advisor or, or something, he says, you're mistaken. You're in the prospecting and promotion business if you're trying to make a living doing this. And this is not to say that there aren't people who just do this and have people call in and they do plans and they're that's just a different business than the one that we're trying to preserve, promote, and propel. And one that I think and I believe clients are happy. To, and you might look at your own experience this way. I believe that when you're in the presence of a great salesperson, a man or woman comes in to talk to you, or you're working with somebody, and they're just bingo, bingo. They help you. They show you. They, they say, I, you know, as you're talking, I, may, I, I thought of this. What about that? I mean, we have car people like this. Uh, I, I have an appliance guy that sells us appliances. And why I need too many appliances, I don't know. Um, but but a, an appliance guy, I need something, Bill's my guy. And it's just amazing. It's like he can read my mind. And you're the same way. You can be exactly the same way. So that's how we, that's sort of like the, the, the general process strategy here. And in that report on this topic, we also go through the, uh, the Solus detailed sales um, uh, process uh, outline, which includes the lead story, marketing, prospecting, approach, fact, find, engagement, analysis, presentation, agreement, uh, delivery, referrals, and reviews, and then getting on to the rest of the story. And it goes into some detail about all of that. One of the things I want to point out before I moved on to the next to step two in this process today is this whole idea of the stories idea, of the stories. And this is on page two, if you happen to, uh, rather, not page two, but on page seven, rather, of the material that uh, is, you, you've got in front of you, I hope, uh, or you can find in any event. And, and these are under lead story. And there can be a lot of stories, like the four stages of life story that gets people thinking and gets them interested. You know, four stages of life. Yeah, I stole this from George Sigurdsson. Stole such a dirty word. Um, borrowed uh, from George. But it's a and he wouldn't mind. He wouldn't, doesn't mind. He doesn't mind. But what he says, well, you know, there, you know how you know how there's kind of like four stages in life. There's the learning stage up to about thirty. Then there's the earning stage from about 30 to about 65. That's the earning stage. Then there's the yearning stage between 65 
And when you're there, you'll understand this to maybe 78 or maybe 80, even where you're trying to make a difference. You've got grandchildren, you've got kids, you want to make a difference in your community with your church. It's the yearning stage where you want to leave. This is where Joe Jordan talks about you want to be significant, not just successful. That's the yearning stage. And then finally, there's the burning stage where you start burning through your money to keep yourself going. And that's kind of like your lifestyle, you know, maybe stay out of a nursing home, do what you got to do, that sort of thing. Learning, earning, yearning, and burning, four stages. That story can get people going. Now you, because it just gets them to talk. There's another one. I have one called the if money were no object story. And what it basically is this, you know, Mr. Prospect, let me just say, before you tell me anything about what you have, let me just say that if money were no object, I want to tell you what I would do if I were you in your situation, knowing what I know in general terms, just, just to give you an idea. If money were no object, this is what I would recommend. I mean, it includes, by the way, permanent life insurance, because who would buy term terminating insurance if money was not, wasn't an object? Of course you wouldn't. Now, by the way, and you say, well, no, Mr. You know, Mr. Ruda, before you get too excited, I know that money is always an object, but I mean, get, let's get started. Let's see what's possible. And then we'll see what works for your budget. Great story. The three ways that prudent uh, investors use life insurance short-term tax-free cash at death, long-term tax-free cash at death, and long-term tax-free cash for life. There's a whole story about that. You can set people up and they go, wow, I've never heard of this. Because everybody hears the first two, short-term and long-term tax-free cash at death. Of course, we've heard that, you know, either term insurance or, you know, something to you know, some kind of cash value or some kind of contract just to provide for a death benefit, whatever you die. But that long-term tax-free cash for life idea, well, that's cash value life insurance as a fixed income, non-correlated asset where that stuff never goes down in value, only goes up in value. You know, in 18 or 20 years, you get all your money back. And after that's like a, the best savings plan you ever had. And it can keep you out of a nursing home when you're in your burning stages it can help you for the, it can help your children your family all the way along through life so there's that one there's one we talk about the 12 boxes how's your essential financial security i can talk about that whole story and maybe someday we should go into all of this but you know the 12 boxes has to do really with there's three sources of income of, of benefits that we have personal company and government so one, two, three across the one, two, three across the top, I guess. And then going down, what do you have for life, disability, critical illness, and retirement? Oh. So we have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, 12 boxes. You go through, what do you have for, you know, what do you have personally for life and you know, for what happens if you die? And what do we have there? What do you have personally for, you know, if you have a heart attack, stroke, or cancer, or some other, you know, dread disease? And we fill in the boxes. It's the coolest thing ever. What a great, great story. We talk about the financial architecture story of Bupinder Anand, who talks about, you know, he wants to make sure that you're fine. So we, we all build, I'm a financial architect, build you a home. And then we want to make sure that the financial architecture, the products, you know, the furniture you've got inside that home all fit that design. We go through that. The value of an annual policy, uh, life insurance policy, um, annual life insurance policy review Bruce Etherington still does most of his business based upon annual reviews, and it's something almost nobody does. What a great story that could be. There's the under 18, the U18 a TFSA or the alternate TFSA for Canadians. You know what? Cash value life insurance is like an alternate TFSA. The un and by the way, you can't have one if you're U18, under 18. That's a sporting reference, of course, but you can't have one there, but you could have one as a life insurance contract, cash value, life insurance, par, whole life, that sort of thing, paid up additions. Also, remember, these are people that use either, like, you know, what do you call it, plus premium, additional deposit options, whatever those things are, to create, again, manipulate a product that creates something that's irreplaceable. You can't replace it. And what I mean by that is that clients don't want to, and nobody can come on the outside and get you to start someplace else. And so there's no end of this 
stashing the cash story. Let me say this, Bruce Etherington told me, and I think we said this in our first meeting with Bruce and Soul is one. You know, there's a guy who at 79 years old, I guess he was technically 78, purchased a $4 million whole life contract, a 10 pay $400,000 annual premium. And he tried to just pass that off one day in a meeting I was um, uh, doing for Million Dollar Roundtable. And I, 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 whoa, 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 what do you mean? What? what? You bought a, like he's 78. You bought a, and I said, didn't you also already, didn't you claim on your, uh, back uh, 20 years ago on your CI, $2 million? Yeah, I did. But I'm better now and I'm good. I said, so why would you buy another $4 million worth of whole life insurance? He says, Jim, you have some idea how much money I make, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, well, then if you don't understand that, you'll know that I needed a place to stash the cash. I said, holy smokes, brilliant. He says, and he says, if I live, look, if I live 10 years, I'll get all my money back in this, whole, in this 10 pay plan that he's put, that he put together. Remember, you can manipulate the additional deposit. In this case, it was a cat life contract, additional deposit option, that sort of thing. He created that. And he says that if I live to be 100, they get, they're going to get $4 million. And if I, if I live to be 90 or 80 or 70, well, not 70, he's already 78. If I live to be 82, they get $4 million extra and they get the money that I didn't put in there yet either. Stash the cash. So this kind of stuff, there are so many different places of looking at how you can do this. There are so many different ways. And that's what I mean by a lead story. If you've got one, man, now, how do you pick the right one? Ah, uh, yes. There's the, uh, and there's the rub. Well, depends on what we're doing. Some of these could be closing strategies. Some of these could be things you may morph into as you're going through. I mentioned before, by the way, John Savage's two types of people, right? Where, where, where did I, I had that, sorry, wrong, wrong department. Remember this thing here? You could just do this thing. This sells permanent life insurance. My buddy Guy Baker, you know, former president of the Million Dollar Roundtable in 2010 in uh, Orange County, California. What does he do? His, his strategy, he talks about compound interest, how the power of compound interest, about it, how it's Einstein's eighth wonder of the world and how people who understand it earn it and people who don't pay it, really, which is pretty much this story here from Savage, who I knew personally was an extraordinary man back in the day, but it's been gone for like 30 years. It's stunning. But the stories never go, uh, never go away. You know, so many places that you can do this. And that's what this is about. I just wanted you to get a flavor of this because when I say lead story, this is it. Remember I talked here about, uh, where are we here? Over here about the uh, inspiration under ICON protocol. This is what I'm getting at. That kind of inspiration. I had a client once in, in Vancouver, um, you know, I went to see him uh, and, and we were having lunch and he says, you know, he says, <clears throat> he says, um, you know, Jim, um, I'm noticing that a lot of people don't really have a lot of energy anymore and they're not really interested in buying anything. I said, really? They, they don't? No, nah, you know, there's just, there's not a, you know, Jim, there's not a lot of, you know, urgency to, to, to do anything anymore. There's just, there's not a lot of urgency. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, you, they just, they don't, they don't really want anything. I said, I said, <laughs> I said, I said, Mike, honestly, you're coming to people like that. You're waiting for them to have the urgency to do something. You'll be waiting for a long time. Horrible. You have to bring the urgency. You, and you know what? That comes from a lead story just like that. So I just wanted you to see that. And, and, and again, you'll see in the rest of the process, it goes on and on. Lots of stuff, lots of ideas, even though that piece sort of ends there uh, relatively uh, quickly. Um, but um, sorry, I've got my stuff all disorganized here. Uh, but, but there's a lot of great information there. And I offer this to you. Again, remember, this is a perspective here, a context for these sales ideas. So, oh, so when, oh, that, so a check-in call, that's a lead story. Uh, yeah, see? And you say, well, I like that. I, I'm going to try that for a bit. I'm just going to replace that here, and that'll be my story. 
let it go. Uh, have, have a run at it. If you heard something or you see something here that interests you, please let me know. I will send it. I will find a way. I'll get it to Andre or, or to Hannah, and we'll, we'll get the thing to you. And you'll have it. Promote, preserve, promote, propel. It's, it's my crusade. It's what I'm doing. So that's step one. Uh, or rather, uh, I guess the step one after everything else we've done, I got a lot of this. I got a lot of step ones, but I want to take you through the the next the um, EFS sales process sales track, uh, which is the uh, another of the handouts that you received from me today. Now, look, there's no way in the next uh, 56 minutes or something I can possibly go through all of this. That's not my intention. And if I had been, I guess. Uh, it, it, I guess I could do, and, and you'll tell me, if you'd rather me do this on a more regular basis and to get more of this in here, uh, I'm thinking of bringing some extra people in as well on that know what I do, more or less, to help do this. And we are, by the way, some in case, in case you're interested, I just signed a lease on a, a five-year lease on a, a, a television studio area for me, uh, 1,200 square feet of studio space that allows me to produce these things uh, better than they do I do today. And I think I do a pretty good job compared to what's out there, but we're going to do even more. And I want to have like flip charts and PowerPoints. I, I, I'm not PowerPoints, flip charts. I want to be able to put, I, I still like the cards idea. I still like doing this, you know, because you can read it. You can hold it. Well, where are we here? Got to get it straight. You can get, I still like that. To me, I want this to be interactive that way. So let me just take you through the EFS sales track um, that, that you got. You got the whole handout. And, and I've, this is an actual sales presentation from beginning to end. This is word for word how you can solve this. Now, when I say <clears throat> word for word, I don't mean there's nothing else to say. And you'll notice this if you compare. If you're looking, you might, some of you may be looking at your looking at what I'm reading from. You know, I'm I'm, I'm reading, working from. So I'm I'm working from this page, and you'll discover that I don't read every single word here. Sometimes I do because it matters. Sometimes I don't because I've talked about something else. But you have to add that. If you don't follow me on Facebook, by the way, I would recommend it highly because I think every once in a while, even a guy like me can say something useful. Uh, and, and and by the way, some comments are very useful also, but it's a place to take a look. But I use a script for every one of those. And I use a script for this. Why? I want to make sure I cover the ground I want to cover. I'll cover up the extras that come to mind as I'm going on. And that adds the heat and the energy. Just the same as you would. If you have it scripted, like you do have it here, you can script this. You could work your way through this. All right. So you know, the, the big problem is this, is that most people have to start from scratch every single time um, they, they do an interview. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, it stuns me, but I see this. They don't really know what they're going to do because I'll ask them. I said, well, can, just give me your talk. Give me your, give me your, what do you say on the phone? What do you, what, and you know, my buddy, uh, Don Hart, uh, would, you know, we used to do this all the time. Uh, give me your prospecting talk. Give me your approach talk. Well, how do you start an appointment? Boom. We used to, we, we used to call that spontaneous role play. And, 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 and we had it down. If you didn't have it down, you're buying coffee for the office. Like it was a bad, it's just a bad idea not to. It's, oh, Jim, that's so salesy. That's so uh, last century. Well, let me tell you something. Some of those people made MDRT in their first year. Some of those people are still making multiples of MDRT. And doing extraordinarily well. Don Hart on his own is a you know, vice president of a major MGA in Canada. Because that's what it takes to do this. Remember that professionals practice until they can't get it wrong. Amateurs practice until they can't, until they get it right. So I'll get that straight. Amateur practices, practices until they get it right. A professional practices until they can't get it wrong. Lots of room between those two things. So don't wing it, do something. Because if you're winging it, that means you've got performance anxiety before every call. You don't even want to make the call. You're more worried about what you're going to say than what they're going to say. So you're, you're listening to reply, not listening to learn. 
That's you miss a lot of information. You miss obvious opportunities because you're too busy figuring out what to do next to catch sales cues coming from their prospects. Someone could say, well, what I really want to do today, Jim, is I want to buy a million dollars on term insurance to cover off my mortgage. And you go, yeah, yeah, I'm not finished my process yet. Just give me a second. And you go, what the hell? Write it out. Help them do that first. I got this information, by the way, from the, 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 the chair of a compliance of a, of a provincial uh, insurance council. The, the, the head compliance guy, you know, he said, you know, if someone says they want to buy a million dollars a term, he says, what's the first thing you have to ask? He says, what's your name and your address and your social security number, your social insurance number, as you as it will. So, you know, you have to practice to get better. You build, you can't, but if you don't have a system, you can't practice because there's nothing to practice. You can't build sales momentum with an idea because the idea changes all the time. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here that you can see that just makes it confusing if you don't get it right. And so this is where people don't get 10 years or 20 years experience. They get one year's experience like 10 times over, 20 times over. So that means a lot of advisors are below their potential because when all is said and done, there's a lot more said than done. It's a great line. I've been used it for 35 years. When all is said and done, there's a lot more said than done. So we wanna find out what people understand and, and how we do that. And, there's three basic steps to this. Establish that there are more complicated problems today than most people understand and can fix on their own. That's kind of the way this goes on and get people to make you their advisor. Set up their thinking about possible life insurance solutions so they can think about what sort of solutions they want for themselves. And then finally ask about what their prospect wants to do to solve the problem. By the way, an interesting point about this is this, is that there's no such thing as a needs analysis. It needs analysis is, is, is so, it suggests you know what they need and nobody wants to be told what they need. In fact, everybody, they, they, it, 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 because here's how it works. Prospects want things to happen, want things for themselves. You know, Van Miller's questions, well, you know, what do you want to happen when, you know, you have, uh, you know, you get a heart attack, stroke, or cancer. What do you want to happen when, you get a, a critical ill. Well, that's sorry, a critical illness. What do you, what what do you want to happen if you get disabled and you can't work? What do you want to happen uh, when you when you retire? What do you want to happen uh, when you can no longer take care of yourself? A long term care thing. And finally, what do you want to happen when you die? So you ask what people want. When you know what they want, you can tell them what they need to get what they want. If I want to catch fish, then I need a fishing rod or a, some kind of serious net to get them. I don't need a net. I need fish. Well, I, I want fish, but I need a net or I need a fishing rod with a appropriate you know, <laughs> hooks on the end of it uh, to get what I want. So that's a big part of this. So the essential financial security track and questionnaire is, is again, part of this handout for you today. Um, and you know, you're gonna see lots of different steps here uh, and lots of information. This is a multicolored presentation for you as well. Uh, and I won't you know, go through, and there's literally, how many pages do we have here? Uh, I think 14, 14 pages or so. I'm not gonna do that, but I wanna highlight this thing. And the idea here is not to debate when you start up with, with clients. We're not here to debate questions with clients, argue with them. We're here to ask questions, but not give answers. And so right there on the front page four of that report, it says, you know, obviously there's a reason you agreed to meet with me today, Mr. Smith, would you mind sharing with me what that is? And again, best first question ever. You can ask that all the time. Answer that, deal with that, whatever it is. Thank you. Now, unless you have a question, may I ask you a few questions? It's always useful to ask permission to ask questions. It's always important that you do that. Why? It's polite and it is very compelling in an interview. By the way, politeness, humility, two things that top clients look for in their, in, their, uh, in, in their financial advisors. So then, in this particular piece, 
goes to a process that, that Van Miller, and I, I acknowledge Van's contribution here dramatically. And he would say, he would talk about different kinds of questions, but do you, do you think that we'll have more or less financial uncertainty in the future? And we give basic questions. Could this come from more waves of the pandemic, another pandemic, another financial crisis, uh, political unrest? I wrote this before there was a war in, the, in, in Ukraine. I mean, you think about how things have changed. You know, do you think you're as prepared as you can be? Again, you could literally use these questions verbatim as they're here and numbered. You could even go through, say, well, Jim, I can't use a questionnaire. Jeez, that just, it just doesn't sound very prof professional. And, uh, au contraire. In fact, it is, it is professional. Now, it's lovely to be able to just rattle this off at the top of your head. Of course it is. Doesn't mean you can't have it in front of you. Like if I didn't necessarily tell you I'm looking at a, at a list, you wouldn't have to know because I prepare, I've done this enough. I know where to look. I'm looking at the lens of my, my camcorder in front of me, big camera that I got in front of me. I'm looking at that camera. So I know, but I can look down and I can make sure that I can get all the answers I need. You know, if we have more financial uncertainty in the world, will that negatively affect your peace of mind and how your family fits and, and go through that? If your family peace of mind drops, will the quality of their life go down? What am I trying to do? I'm just trying to get their sense of what's going on. I'm just trying to get their sense of what's going on. You know, and if we have more financial security, sorry, financial uncertainty, less peace of mind than a lower quality of life, that make life harder for you. Yeah, it would. And no, it wouldn't. Whatever. I'm not arguing with them. I'm just taking notes how they feel. I'm setting, I'm trying to get them to, I'm trying to put them in the right context to make that decision to inspire themselves rather to be to inspire them to make the decision they have to make you know what would that mean if one of your one of the breadwinners died how would that work you know there's a, there's a business question there you can ask also you know and then some things that van really talks about directly and he would and i i called this in in the in a report that we did for advisor craft uh which i think you folks should be getting in, in the in universal sales starter uh uss I think it's the best thing ever, you know, because do you think taxes will be higher or lower in the future? And by the way, you don't even have to necessarily have the initial part of this. You could, you again, you could short circuit it if you know what you're going to do. But will you think taxes will be higher in the future? You know, with all that's going on, could they be a lot higher? Now, here's a question that your accountant or your lawyer may never ask you, but tell me something. Do you want to pay those taxes? No, I don't. Is that a good question? Is that a good thing to have somebody to have your prospect say? Of course it is. It's extraordinary, right? Um, what do you do today to ensure you don't pay those extra taxes? Won't the government go after people who already pay taxes to pay more? What are you going to do? Like asking questions. You see this discussion? This is a general discussion, as I said at the very beginning. You know, if we have higher taxes in the future, do you think we're going to have lower government benefits or poor access to them? You think it's going to get worse? So higher taxes, lower benefits. Do you think that's a thing? You can count on it. And we don't have to, again, I'm not telling them this. I'm asking. And I'm asking, as I said once in a recent uh, Facebook Live, you ask dispassionately to see what they really think. Do you think taxes will be higher or lower in the future? And they go, Absolutely. Unbelievable. Of course they're going to go up. Now we know that's a hot button. But if I say, do you think taxes are going to go up? They go, yes, I do. What does that tell us? Nothing. That tells us that they reacted the way we asked the question. So you'd be very careful. I mean, aren't, I mean, aren't poorer benefits, it isn't higher, by the way, if we have higher taxes and poorer benefits, doesn't that mean we'll likely have higher inflation? Oh, by the way, uh, oh, oh, and, oh, is in fact, exactly that happened, isn't it? It's exactly what went on. And isn't inflation really a stealth tax that applies to everybody? Yeah, it is. And with all of that going on, you think we're going to get more volatility, as Van would say, in the stock market? You see, it's just a great discussion. And it doesn't even matter what you're selling. You could be selling money product full time. I don't even care. The RSPs, whatever you're doing, this, all of this gets people thinking in the right thing. By the way, in the idea about volatility, you know, do you think with, with volatility, you, you, things going up and down like that, do you think you could lose some money? Yeah. Do you think you, you, you could lose lots of money? Yeah. You think you could lose it all? Well, maybe. What would that do to your sense of security in the future? Whoa. You know, you know, if all of that goes on, then find the, the final question here would be something like, you know, well, 
you know, wouldn't you be in danger? You think oh, for all that going on, do you think you could ever be in danger of outliving your money in retirement, that longevity would step in and that could be a problem if you live long enough? And and remember, that's the cool answer, a cool, cool line here. And, and Vance says it all the time. And you hear, you hear it from my buddy, Tom Hegna, in the same way. He said, let, I think Tom said it first. Well, let's be honest, Mr. Smith. If you retire at 65 and you die at 70, we don't really have a problem planning your retirement, do we? It's not really a problem. But if you have to be 90, there could be a concern, right? Because longevity is the uh, the risk multiplier to all of this, all of those risks and, you know, that we have financially for our essential financial security. And remember, along the way, you're trying to get them to get your prospect to ask for help. I don't know what I would do. I don't know what I would do. I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. And you hear those things to say, well, tell you what, they're asking you to be their advisor. And now you can start asking them questions. You can start asking them questions, but you want to make sure you give them the context. And I think before the questions comes the context. And this is where in the sales process part two that you're seeing here on page eight, if you're looking, uh, we talk about the three ways that prudent investors all like you use life insurance for, for their estate. And these are all good things. And there's no bad ways. They're just things, there's different ways that smart uh, prudent, not smart, prudent people use. First way is short-term tax-free cash at death. Remember, we talked about this, long-term tax-free cash at death. And the last and the least known of those is the, thir uh, the third way, long-term tax-free cash for life. Now, interestingly here, there's another angle, which we haven't, uh, which I didn't include here, but I, I like it. There's a fourth way, and I call that um, uh, generational tax-free cash for family nobility. Generational tax-free cash for family nobility. You see, if you leave enough money in your estate to your family, it could be the end of anybody ever living paycheck to paycheck, hand to mouth. I know how this works, and I've seen this work. It's the most amazing thing. People who don't need the life insurance for any risk management idea, I don't like that word, but well, I'll talk about that later. Have, have what they do is they leave it and it changes the financial trajectory of their family forever when they're gone on their deathbed. They'll know that this place will never be the same. It'll be way better. It's an amazing thing. So we have that. And so short-term tax-free cash at death, line of credit loans, mortgages, business loans, family loans, survivor survivor's income until a spouse can be reestablished, all of those things. Long-term tax-free cash at death, final medical expenses, burial, funeral expenses, capital gains on vacation properties or rental properties, income taxes on the second death of an RSP or RIF, legacy or philanthropic bequests. There's a little sentence, a little paragraph here on page nine. It's a killer angle. Well, I'm gonna. How many people am I say to you? Well, I'm gonna leave my RRSP to my kids. They can. Have, that'll be good. It's a, it'll be three quarters of a million bucks. Those two kids have a lot of money. If it were only so, because it turns out that half of your RRSP when mom, or your RRIF, your RIF, uh, when you pass, half and both mom and dad are gone. Uh, you're in partnership with the federal government, and they get half in Ontario, fifty three point five three percent. But it's plus or minus 50% across the board in this country. And even in the United States, there are similar kinds of considerations about this. So that's a huge deal. And then long-term tax-free cash for life gives you a whole bunch of things. A tax-sheltered reserve that can augment retirement income for life creates a fixed income, non-correlated asset, a reserve that builds uh, and protects against economic downturns and, and downturns and, and pandemics that always grows, can never get smaller. It's double duty dollars. Remember that? Double duty. That's an old line from way back, but it provides insurance money, but it also provides cash. It's extraordinary things. See, as I say here, life insurance is not about what you need. No one needs any life insurance. Uh, what you buy and how much you buy is all about what you want for yourself and your family. And then you can start asking questions. So we've gone to that, we go to this. So part three is getting the details you need to sell. And so, you know, here's what we're doing. You know, what do you want to happen when you're sick or injured and you need the money to pay for the home, uh, pay for belts at home or at the office? 
and you start writing these things down. You can have these questions. It, do, it doesn't have to be in a questionnaire format. It doesn't have to be on a, on a digital format on, on blocks where you're typing in information. You can write this down to these questions. What do you want to happen? You have a heart attack, stroke, or cancer. You need money for treatment, or you can't, or you can get better so that you can get better, or you want the time to get better, to convalesce. What do you do? What's your plan for dealing with this? Do you have a guaranteed reserve for this now? How much would you need? That kind of thing. We go through that with great detail here. By the way, one of the greatest sales ideas for critical illness that we've come up with in the last few years has been the idea of buying for couples, you know, uh, two people who are living together to say, you know, you know, like, for example, I'll use my, my wife and I, if Rhonda were to get a heart attack, stroke or cancer and needed to convalesce, needed six months off, you know what she'd want? She'd want me to be with her all the time. She doesn't need, there's nobody else to take care of her. Uh, our daughter's in college. Uh, my kids are old, have their own situations. <laughs> they got their own, I be, she'd want me. If I was to get a, if I was to have a stroke and needed help, I'd want her. Now, we're, we have critical insurance that would provide for this, but you can offer this opportunity for people. You know, we know that, by the way, one of the best things would be to give each person in that couple double the coverage, the husbands, the wives, the partner A, partner B, however you want to put it, get both coverages. So if we may each make 100000 they get at least one year of, I can help you, you can help me. So they get a $200,000 contract and there's a reason for it. Now, by the way, that pays all the bills, of course, but it also means that I can take the time off. And that would, isn't that why we buy life insurance? Because we love somebody. Why we buy critical illness? Because we care. And so I might want two years or three years and you could do that joint coverage or, you know, maybe, maybe I want a year and then I want another couple of years to convalesce. I only need my own income. And we saw it off. It's a simple thing. There's no real formula for it, but it does work very well. So we, we can, uh, you know, what do you want to happen when you retire? And, you know, this is, you can use insurance to fit in this. I've got a client in New Jersey, for example, who has a, the company's called, you know, whatever, you know, Joe Smith Retirement Planning, and they work with life insurance to augment a balance of other life insurance products. Now, I know not everybody buys this. Not everybody likes this. Some people have a nervous breakdown. I've got a potential client uh, out west right now who is strictly on another basis, uh, doesn't buy whole life at all, doesn't think that's a thing. Not a problem. I don't, have any, I, don't have any, I don't have any problem with this. I'm saying that's a possibility. You can do that. What do you want to happen when you can no longer take care of yourself? You know, given our recent experience, do you ever want to be in a nursing home? What, what would you want to put anyone, would you ever want to put anyone that you love in a nursing home? The questions are all there. It works out quite nicely. And then finally, what do you want to happen when you die? So I have a, I have a client who's just worked on a questionnaire that just works those five questions and gets answers, fills in the blanks and asking, what do you need? What do you, what do you want for your family? What do you want to happen when you die? What do you want to happen when you retire? What do you want to happen when you're sick or injured and you can't work? What And the money stops. Let me tell you a short story about my daughter, Catherine, uh, who is a, a lawyer who worked very hard. She's got three, three degrees, two, uh, two law degrees, my master of law. Um, and uh, she had a baby last fall, uh, my, my grandson, Benjamin. What a wonderful little, little critter that guy is. Uh, well, not that little, I was growing like a weed. But in any event, um, this, you know, two things have happened to her. Um, and, and that have really made something that I forced her to do very valuable. Uh, early on, when she first became a lawyer, I made sure that she bought uh, a grad plan disability insurance policy. And I did that because I said, look, it's the price you pay for being a professional. Get the thing, dad, it's like $256 a month. Oh, you're crazy. Where will I find this? I said, your responsibility is to do this. You must do this. Dad, Catherine, she did it. Uh, and she paid for, uh, she, like, she, was, she was a lawyer for about a year and a half, uh, two years maybe before, uh, you know, and then COVID and whatever else. Anyway, so what happens? She has the baby. Well, doesn't she suffer from um, postpartum depression and taking treatment for that? And then something, mad, something horrible happened. Catherine suffered a seizure in her backyard, collapsed, you know, you know, bit of grand mal seizure um, for reasons nobody understood. 
and still don't really. But she's heavy duty, heavy duty treatment, et cetera. It's it's terrible. And I, I tell you this because Catherine was a nationally rated figure skater in her day, an athlete. No reason to presume. Nobody has epilepsy. Nobody thought we would ever have anything like this. She had not, her grandparents died in their 80s and 90s uh, and beyond. Nobody supposed she should have any problem like this. You know what? And finally, it uh, was in about June we, or July, I guess we, we made the first application for, for claim uh, for her. And then the other day, she got a five-figure check back paying to when they said, think about this, back paid to when they said disability technically started because they got all the evidence from everybody. And we're still taking her to test on Friday. I'll be taking her to a to another test yet because they're doing cardiac and brain stuff. And they're, you know, and she's she's been photographed every which way, you know, uh, x-rayed and MRI'd and CAT scanned and everything else. Um, but I say this because there's a 35-year-old woman in perfectly good, good health, gave birth to a healthy baby, and now does not know when she can go back to being a lawyer. But her money, even that base plan of $2,500 a month, plus, by the way, FIO, because you could get it on claim, which she applied for, good agent, did that for her. What do we have? She says, Dad, it's changed my life. She cried. When I told her it would happen, she cried. She says, Dad, you know, interest rates are going up. The mortgage is costing more, everything. And now I have this money, tax-free money every single month. So if you know any lawyers, any accountants, any, 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 any dentists or doctors, that are, or chiropractors, whatever, and, and you can get a grad plan for them, do it. I know one of my, I think somebody on this call, in fact, did this this the other day and found it was able to turn somebody around the last minute the same way by telling Catherine's story. Feel free to do that anytime. So that kind of goes on. Now, how much money can you invest in yourself and your family? Number six, but, you know, and so we start to make proposals and we started making uh, information, started getting information here uh, on page 12. Uh, and, and it's, you know, we need to do some things. It, we always talk here about proposing at least $2 million of life insurance at a minimum expense right now. We'll buy short-term tax-free cash at death because it's going to take some planning, but let's get the term in place before we figure out what, to, what kind of plan you might want. Look, the right amount is way more important than the right kind. Because if, as everybody will tell you, nobody who presents a check to a, to a widow male or female, and nobody says, well, was that term insurance? They just want to know how much was it. Always prepare and take care of your families first. And then, of course, we get we, maybe we prepare some of this stuff and we say, when can we get back together again? And then we're going and off we go. And remember, you're presenting presentations later on and don't. And on page 13, I explain how you create cash value illustrations and you use illustrations on top of illustrations. Don't just hand out 50 pages, 30 pages of illustration and say, well, figure that out because be, nobody gets it. You have to have your own summary. My buddy, Mark Halperin, will have a summary of all these things. Everybody I know will think about it, will work on it, and then they will put it together. They'll put the proposal together. And, they'll, and it'll be append, the appended to it are the illustrations that are recommended. But they will have this, they will be able to tell the story. And you've got all of that information here um, in this piece as well. Now, I, again, I don't suppose that all of the, that this is uh, complete and full and everything else, and that there's nothing else you need to know. But is, this does take you from A to B uh, to A to Z. A to Z, depending on which part of the process we're into, helps you to uh, to get the information uh, that you need for your client. So that is a sales process uh, that you've got and you can use. Now, uh, I should say one other thing, that I do have yet another shorter version of this, which I didn't send you. Um, and, you know, if you if you want one of these, let me know. This is a short life insurance sales process. This is only a few pages long. Again, another strategy. I think we'll just send it out. Never mind. I'll just send it out. I want you to have it. It'll, you'll, you'll see it's, it's just the words. 
Um, and, uh, and it's kind of easy, straightforward stuff. He uses a few more buzzwords in here, uh, rather power phrases. You know, for example, you know, Mr. Prospect, when you die, would you rather leave your family a house or a mortgage? Like questions like that that can be very valuable to you. I will make sure that uh, you get a copy of that on the way uh, after, after we're done today. So you'll have that as well. So in the next 25 minutes, let me go through something that I really believe um, is uh, useful for all of us here. Um, oh, I just, I just noticed there was a question. Uh, Rick Fox from way back uh, <laughs> said, uh, best opening line ever works every single time. Thank you, Rick. Um, I appreciate that. And it, it does work. <laughs> See, that's the thing. When you understand the sales pro, the professional sales process, you get the benefit of these lines. And that's why, so when we get sick, we get people back in here, new people, uh, new, 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 and I've got a, a whole list of top people to come in. Uh, but I give you the perspective, and we can do more of these as well. So let me just say this about practice, life insurance practice management traps, life insurance advisor practice management traps. Um, I was doing some work for another for a corporate client, and it occurred to me that there's a whole bunch of silly stuff that passes for advice in terms of how you manage your business. Now, what does this have to do with sales? Well, the best sales ideas in the world are all goofed up if you don't have them set up in the right foundation, put in the right place. And as my old buddy, John Canary used to say to me, uh, and it was a real Will Rogers quote, and it, it, just think about this. He says, it's not what you don't know that hurts you. It's what you know that isn't so. That's what hurts you. It's what you think you know that's wrong that really hurts you. Canary told me that years ago. It was a Will Rogers thing. He's got several versions, versions of it. You can look it up. So the idea that the things we believe to be absolutely true, but were actually false, were causing me grief in my life, my business was very scary. <laughs> and there are at least 14 of them in this business. And I think you need to know, <clears throat> and it's the difference between being a life insurance advisor, a life insurance based advisor, where that's where, you're, where the predominance of your revenue comes from, and being a money advisor. I'm not saying one is better than the other. Uh, the money guys have got all the help they can stand. It's the insurance guys that don't have the, the stuff because everybody thinks that the well, let's face it, they're the it's the you know it's the the ugly cousin of of the of the of the financial services industry is the life insurance business. Oh, Jim, it's so nobody wants to be an insurance agent except all the best people I've ever met in this business. Uh, John Firstbrook, insurance agent, Van Miller, insurance insurance agent, Tony Gordon, insurance agent, uh, uh, George Sigurdsson, insurance agent. That's what they call themselves. You can do the same. So we want to be able to split these things off. And, you know, I've been able in the last, you know, uh, about October, October 13th will be 45 years in and around this business. <clears throat> as someone pointed out to me years, excuse me, as someone pointed out to me a few years ago, Jim, if you had shot some, your, your branch manager, when you entered the business, you'd have been out of jail by now. Um, but <laughs> I'm still in it because I've come to love this business. I've come to love people like you who are prepared to put themselves in line every single day to help out. So practice management traps. What are these things? Well, these are things that has the opposite effect of what you expected. You think they're helping, but they're actually hurting. And they're insidious in the, in the business because um, it's like that's all we get now. We, we get these traps and we really have to, I think if you understand them, and I'm not sure you'll completely understand them after I go through it briefly now, but you will and you can read through it. And I'm just, we're just putting together a little booklet on this topic because I think it's that important and how it goes. See, practice management today is essentially promoted and built for an investment trailer compensation model. So to work effectively, it requires regular income unrelated to new sales. That's the essence of every practice management thing we go. Oh, well, you've got this, oh, I'm going to have 100000 a year coming in anyway, 300000 a million dollars a year coming in anyway. So everything else, we can do a whole bunch of other things. 
It's based in a holistic model, which is but but the fine, but it's based in the money business where you get a recurring revenue stream. In the life insurance business, where it's it, the game is just different. But so it's not another point about the investment business, and that is that it it's a high management business. It's a high uh, maintenance business. Let's face it, the money business today never been, look, it was always high maintenance, but now it's crazy high maintenance uh, between compliance just to get in, onboarding clients, maintenance, all of this stuff, reporting, KYC, KYP, I don't know, some, whatever, KY something. They're knowing you, and the compliance rules, there's a new CRM3 coming here in Canada. Dear Lord, how will you ever keep up? And in fact, most advisors are not keeping up, which is where, where they get themselves into trouble. I'm not fond of that. I think, to be honest, the idea is that you really want to, um, uh, you need, if you're going to be in the insurance business, and that's a real, that's a full-time job on its own, you want to work with somebody or refer your money business elsewhere. Because I, you know, I tell you what, all the big cases on the, on the, you know, in, in the national accounts world happens because somebody worked with a top a multi, a billionaire, a billion dollar book of business client, and they found these big cases. So that's pretty much going on. So I'm going to try to give you these these um, these quick traps uh, in the next 20 minutes or so, so that you can understand um, how they're affecting you. Number one is what I call the maximum client count trap. Now, in the investment business, they say you only have about 130 clients, maybe less. Some people are cutting back even further than that. Uh, I have a client who thinks, it, or a friend actually in the business, who says he thinks he can get by with 20 or 30. And I'm guessing you can. I don't know how you sell life insurance on a regular basis to those people, unless those 30 people have got, I'm talking, serious money. This whole thing came back, I think, started back in the day of the AGF uh, funds, back when they were talking about there's, if there's 2,000 year, uh, 2,000 years, 2,000 hours in a year. And everybody needs uh, 15 hours, then you only can have about 130 clients. In fact, some life insurance companies, career life insurance companies, hold up this standard as a possibility in the life insurance business, which I got to tell you is nauseating. It's not right. It's totally wrong. Uh, and it won't help you. And it doesn't help them either. So, when you get a world where a guy like George Sigurdsson has over 5,000 clients, Lauren Schechter, top disability insurance agent with uh, for financial, uh, sorry, for doctors across Canada, has 5,500 doctors in his clientele. Van Miller has over seven to 8,000 clients today. You discover that there's something we're not getting right in this regime under this idea. The maximum client count number of say 130, 100, 150 is a trap. You get to thinking that you're, you, you can only have so many clients and it's really not an answer at all. Number two, uh, and I think that's, it's, it's sort of related directly to this, is, is this, is the times, uh, the service time over commitment. And what I mean by that is this, is that Going back to that AGF study, 15 hours, we think every client needs 15 hours, but every insurance client doesn't need 15 hours. See, the, the investment business is high maintenance. If I have $3 million with, with, my, with my, uh, you know, my, my TD private investment counsel guy, or $5 million or $10 million, I expect reports from him. I expect when I call, he answers the phone. I expect that guy will deal with this. It doesn't happen. I got a $3 million insurance policy with somebody. I don't have to call them every day. I can call, how's my $3 million of whole life insurance going? Fine. Value went up last year and it'll keep going up. It'll never go down. That kind of thing. I encourage you to look more about that. The replacement client prospecting trap in the, the holistic uh, money-based business prospecting is like, well, you know, you've got 150 clients, 130 clients, you keep replacing the bottom ones only. So you only need, and you'll see this, people will say, I'm only onboarding. I'm looking to, I have a client in, in Calgary. I'm only looking to onboard, like I think seven this year. What the hell are you doing? There? What are you doing the rest of your time? But, and, and by the way, you know what his problem is? We're not making enough money. 
but they're built into a system that requires them to service all this stuff and it slows them down. So replacement client is a trap too. You need to build by having not 10 new clients a year and replace to replace the current bottom 10. It's about working with a list of something like say 200 and you should have that kind of prospect list. Remember the prost, uh, rather the uh, project forever? You can have 200 people in there. These are people we're trying to pull out. And then you get maybe 10, a new, 10 new ones every month. Now we're talking. There's also the trap four, which is the advice don't sell trap. And we don't, we, and we're, we're talking, so remember, money business is a greed purchase. But we say, well, we want to, we, we advise them. I have a client, a client company I worked with years ago that said, you know, we don't sell anything here. We only help people understand their current options related to their current situation and allow them to f make a decision to purchase something at their, in their own good time that may solve their problems that they're looking at. Something gobbledygooky like that. I can't even tell you. So this is not true for life insurance. People need sales help. You need to be a professional salesperson if you want to be great in this business. I, there's a trap called the all my time with clients trap. Oh, if I could spend all my time with my clients, I would be so much more productive. No, you won't. You, if you spend all your time with prospects, oh, now you'd be doing that. And I mentioned, I quoted this before, you know, it was Al Granham that said, you need to spend 60% of your day prospecting and promoting your business if you're in the sales business. But if you're spending like one day out of 10 or one two days out of 10 prospecting, your results will be dismal and predictable also. You just can't put up a sign and people just can send you life insurance money. It just doesn't happen like that. There's also this trap, uh, this the plan first trap. And it sounds, see, this is very, it's very attractive planning first because we think, well, God, I need to have a plan. It makes such sense. Like we used to have, we'd draw a pyramid and the plan would be on the bottom and the plan is the base of every good situation and how we work with our clients. We do a plan first, except that slows everything down, including for the prospect. And if you look on page 11 there, you'll see what I'm talking about. It slows it down from them. While you're planning, people can lose their insurability. They could lose their lives. They could lose so much. And that's why you have essential financial security. To you know, here's, a, here's another version. Thank you, Norm Lang. Another snappier version of the same thing. Where are we? Here we are. Um, you know, the essentials where you don't have to have a plan. You only have to have the desire to be more financially secure and who doesn't remember peace of mind equals quality of life peace of mind equals quality of life so plan first is a trap the big case trap another example well i only go for the big cases you know i, I don't really want to get i i mean i have a i have a friend and, I, and a client who, who would say well i, I won't even go across the street for twenty thousand dollar case for twenty thousand dollar premium that was the day, by the way, I really began to feel terrible about having let my license go. Because I'm thinking I travel across the street for $20,000 all day. Uh, you know why? Because it seemed like still, still seemed like good money. I know, I know he's working in a six-figure uh, premium market. I get it. Uh, but holy smokes, if a guy would spend $20,000 this year or $30,000 this year, might he spend $50,000 next year or another $20,000 and another and another? There's a couple of things you want to remember. Your attitude is inversely related to the length of time since your last sale. Your attitude about this business, about yourself, about your success, your confidence level is inversely related to the length of time since your last sale. What does that mean? I mean, if your sale was yesterday, it's one over one. One day, one day. That's 100%. Perfect. If it was 10 days ago, it's one over 10. That's inverse. One over something. So one over 10. That's one tenth. And you know this. The longer you go without a sale, the less confident you are, the less successful you are in making sales. This is how that goes. If it was 100 days ago, it's one over 100, not worth talking about. Something else. Um, there's a guy that I worked with many years ago, very successful advisor, top, top, top clients in this country. 
And he told me this. He said, and it's quoted here. He says, if you chase a big case and you don't get it, you don't have any new business in the mill. And he says, what's worse, if you chase a big case and you do get it, you still won't have any new business in the mill. Either way, you'll be left with no new business, and that is never a good thing. I was in his office one day, and he, we, we were just chatting. He opened the door and out to, out to his staff. He had, I think, three girls, forgive me, three staff people out there. Um, and he said, uh, you see, Jim, you see those people out there? I said, yeah. Well, what are they doing? I said, um, not a lot. Not, not much. He says, that's my problem. He says, I have unused capacity. I hate that. I, they could be processing business. My job is to keep them busy all the time. Van Miller, two girls, well, they are girls, two people work for, the, for him. They're busy all the time. He's already written more than 800 cases this year. It's extraordinary. They're busy. Un, so think about that. Unused capacity. It's a terrible thing to have. So you can, inoc your, you can inoculate yourself from big case-itis. By the way, that's what this is called. We called it that 30, 40, 50 years ago, and we still call it that. Try to pursue regular-sized business as well, because that opens the door to big business too. Absolutely does. You know, how do you catch big fish by going fishing? You know, yeah, you got changed the lures now and again, but I can remember like it was yesterday, uh, we were at, at our place in Florida years ago, my, my daughter, five years old, six years old, Abigail was, uh, we had, I had literally a piece of line attached to the end of a bamboo rod, like a bamboo stick. And I had a piece of, uh, uh, I think a piece of bacon on a tiny hook attached uh, to this little hook. And we were fishing in, in the canal behind the, behind the house um, for, uh, for sunfish. Oh, and you could get, you know, they, oh, they get a guy. Oh, daddy, she'd be so excited. And she'd flip them over. I'd unhook them to them back. <laughs> it was just great fun. And I'll never forget as long as I live. She's, she, she gets one, daddy, daddy, I got one. So I go over to watch. And as I'm watching, as she, she's pulling this sunfish out, this little fish, maybe that big, all of a sudden I see a mouth about this big. <laughs> And it was a huge largemouth bass, about six pounds, grabbed onto that thing. And now the ride is on. The ride is on. It was amazing. Daddy, daddy. And I'm saying, I would have to say, we, we dragged it in. By the way, the hook had nothing to do with it because the whole fish was in his mouth and he couldn't get the fish out of his mouth. We, we brought, actually caught the fish. So we were fishing for little fish, but big fish show up. If you want to get, you want to eat, you need the fish. You want big fish, keep fishing. And big ones show up as show up too. Number eight is the jack of all trades trap. And boy, does that ever happen in this business? We're big on this in this industry. We want to be able to do everything. And I remember as a guy years ago told me this, and I, I never forgot. He said, you know, he had a phone call. He said, uh, you got a phone call from one of his top clients. He said, you know, he said, uh, he said, the guy's name was Jim. He said, Jimmy, I I, I got a call from this competitor of his, of Jim's, and he said, um, I, uh, the guy says he's an estate planner, which today would be like a financial planner or whatever. Uh, he said he can do everything for him. He's a big guy, big, big shooter. He says, um, I looked at your business card. It just says insurance agent. And the guy was our top agent in the office at the time. He says, I'm looking at his card. Your card says insurance agent. His says estate planner. You could think financial planner, financial advisor, you know, comprehensive financial, whatever you want to call it. He said, oh, why should I deal with an insurance agent? when I can deal with a financial planner. And Jim was amazing. Absolutely was. He said, well, you know, I think to be a good financial planner, you need to be a good banker, a good trust officer, a good tax accountant, a good estate and tax lawyer, a good estate planner, uh, a good investment advisor, a good property and casualty insurance, and a good life insurance. He says, he says Bob, I got to tell you, I just don't think I'm smart enough to do all of that at once. And he shut up. I was listening to him. Because my office was across the, I'm going, where the heck's this going to go? And then he says, oh, and then I hear, okay, fine, click, hangs up. I said, okay, Jim, what, what did he say? He, I he says, I told him all that. He says, yeah, you know, you know, Jim, you're right. I'll tell the other guy to go to hell. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. But that's the story. I want to be good at what I do. You don't have... If you're a jack of all trades, you will be a master of none. That's exactly what happens. Nobody wants to be working in any place except your sweet spot. I want your expertise. I don't need your basic, you've been there before. You've seen the thing. I want you to be an expert. That's the idea. 
in the investment business, there's also the number nine called the two hats trap. We think you have an insurance hat and an investment hat, hat, but it's wrong. We actually have two heads. You need a head for investments. You need a head for insurance. You need a heart for insurance, to be honest. And that's a big part of this. You can't be all things to all people. As they say, that dog don't hunt. It don't work that way. It just doesn't. You need to be special. There's a special mindset to be a good investment advisor. These are good people to do a good job. It's important, but you want them to concentrate. You don't, you, and you want an investment advisor who understands this. I'm thinking about my buddy, Lawrence Geller, uh, who was extraordinarily the depth in, of knowledge. Mark Halpern, uh, Van George, I mean, Bruce Etherington, unbelievable depth where they are experts. They are not weak at this. These are people, you know, I, I've been promoting this for years. My buddy, uh, and I'm, I'm doing a program coming up shortly with uh, Wayne Cotton on this, on best case scenario to work this out. But I wrote this in a book like this, you could buy on the website, Expert Identity Marketing is still available. Uh, and it was exactly that to find out where that is. So you only have to wear one hat at a time. There's another thing that drives me nuts is this whole idea of risk management. You know, and, and the investment business has relegated life insurance to being risk management. It's only, is there a hole? Let's fill it. That's all the job is. I think it's a terrible weakness. I think it's, there's also a lifestyle income creation aspect to this. And I think it's something that needs to be talked about and dealt with. Life insurance is more than just risk management if you know what you're doing. You position it properly with your clients. You do the thing properly. Everything works out fine. That's fine. Something else. I had this discussion back in 2010, and it was it was published on the main, uh, rather in Round the Table magazine. I was on the main cover. It was called Better Than ABCs. This is the client segmentation trap. Again, more information in here, but let me tell you what this means. Everybody tells you you need A clients, B clients, and C clients because you have to doll out your services and your time. Again, this is all based on the original model. You understand this, right? So we only have so much time for those people to only give us $5,000 or have only given us five, but I think it was a 500. We have to do this. This is a weakness in our business that it doesn't, top, many top advisors I know don't do this. My buddy, Lawrence Geller, Great example. He says, anybody I choose to take on gets the best possible service I can provide because that's what I do. Remember this, if you don't provide best service to everybody, and you, I, I don't think you should have a client segmentation strategy that you wouldn't want on the front page of your local newspaper. Say, well, yeah, we, we, uh, we provide better help to people who are richer than poor people. I think that would really sell today. Not, no chance, right? I don't think that's a deal. Geller says, everybody I work with gets the same thing. George Sigurdsson says, remember I said before, he gives out a policy wallet, a leather wallet, a pad folio. To, it doesn't matter what they buy because now they're a client and they feel like that and they grew into it. And besides which, as Lawrence will tell you, he says, some of my largest cases have come from those smallest first sales. The guy bought a million dollars of term insurance for the mortgage. And the next thing I know, he, wanted, he spent a million dollars on something else. Life insurance, amazing how that goes. Number 12, firing clients trap. See, again, it fits into segmentation and all of this stuff. Well, you should be firing some of those clients. You just don't need that. It's just a ballast. It's just a bad thing. Hiring clients, by the way, is segmentation and firing clients the same thing in this, in this sense? Remember this, is that what happens is that we're get, we get a bad reputation because people were fired. And I got to tell you, being fired, and I have been fired by one of the agents that I worked with. He sold me some stuff, and he said, and and I, I he had a long dis we had a long discussion afterwards. But I can tell you, even the nicest, and he tried to write a nice letter saying, "I'm going to let this." It wasn't fired. He was pushing me off to an associate. It felt like being dumped at prom. Is how bad it felt. I couldn't believe it, and he he had no idea. I said, "You can't be doing that." Firing clients. And remember, if you know the 80-20 rule, so you know, is that if we we only give our best service to 20% of our clientele and 80% get our me service, that means that most of our work 
most of our branding is on the bad side, not the good side. This is a big deal and you can fix that. Dabbling income stream trap. Another example of things that we think, well, we need to have more income streams. That's why you do multiple product lines, why you do stuff that how much, how many people got burned by things like Portis and, and some of these um, even, you know, more and more maybe main line kinds of secondary off book kinds of deals. That's not how this works. It's, it's a trap. You think you're making money, but it's drawing money from elsewhere. And the last one I'll leave you with is this, the caretaking trap. This is where you think if you buy a book of business and you caretake it, you'll, be a, you'll pro provide a better business. Now, there's always going to be somebody who will tell you, well, I've done that. It does very well. And I understand that. There's also a chance there's a, a China teapot in an elliptical orbit around Mars, too, as my friend Alistair Ricard used to say, God rest him. It's just not something you want to bet your house on. So if you want to build a business, you build it the way you want it. You build it with the clients that you want, that you like, that like you back with your natural market, where you have natural influence. You work with that best case scenario, as Wayne Cotton says, as my expert identity, where you work, where your expertise and your experience kind of come together to help a particular group of people that really matter to you. When you do all of those things, you'll be in business. So there is the basis of the 14 practice management traps. And I really do hope you've got that. So in the next three minutes, let me just wind this up. I do hope that that has been helpful to you. There's lots of material. Oh, and it's been a lot to digest, but you have the handouts. You've got coming the AI transcript of all of this, which ought to be novel for my mumbling on occasion, and the video to help you review. And by the way, some just so you know, some people don't take the video. They download the audio and they play the audio back in the car. And that's, I know several people who do that, and it, maybe it's for you too. Uh, they want to review, rehearse, practice, and perfect uh, all of this. And I encourage you to do that. Find a way to install these things into your business and to use this and to use this as a context for the next session. When I am so excited to tell you, it's going to be George Sigerson. I, I, I can't, I, George is like a brother to me better in so many ways. And George is going to be talking to you about, uh, again, like, let me just say this about George Sigerson, if you don't know. He's a good friend of mine. He's one of the most successful advisors in the world. He's Van Miller's hero and one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. George Sigurdsson will talk about his signature sales presentations, and they are amazing. They really are something special. I want to thank also our sponsors, Custom Plan Financial Advisors, Bruce Etherington and Associates. He didn't just speak here he bought the company, <laughs> so to speak. He's right there, uh, Bruce Atherton. What an extraordinary man he is. Forrester's Financial Group, Enforced Life Financial, my buddy, uh, Shandrin Russell Ingham, uh, and, and the group, uh, and, and Chen uh, and others. And of course, Insurance Portal, the sponsors of the Canada Sales Congress coming up on October 26th, live in Toronto. So we will see you Tuesday, October 4th for Solace number eight with none other than George Sigurdsson. Please mark your calendars. Solace is always planned for the first Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, it's been a delight to be with you today. Um, this is the this is my whole life. I love this stuff. My family, my, well, my church, my faith, my family, and this business, and what we are able to do with you. Uh, we were when I was in Las Vegas recently. Had people look up to me and say, "Remember, you said this five years ago changed my life." Nothing means more to me than that. Um, I, I just try to make the world a better place. You know, kind of it's my crusade. So, God bless you all. I wish you all the very best. Have a wonderful fall. We'll see you on October fourth. And as I love to say now, go be amazing.